Don't smile. Don't smile at the camera. See, I'm panning. Ah, okay. Show you my Marie Antoinette doll. I showed you this last year, didn't I? You want to see the Marie Antoinette doll? You know who Marie Antoinette is? You know what happened to Marie Antoinette? She was beheaded. The Marie Antoinette doll. I used to have one before, and the head would shoot out like four feet, so I would shoot it at students. Then somebody broke it. I know. That'd be another good one, somebody walking by and I'm holding a doll off. That's the AP class. Okay. So, just a review of a couple things, but we got to kind of tie things together because we're coming to this incredibly important event, Bacon's Rebellion. So let's review. First off, 1607, what's that first colony in Virginia? Jamestown. That was the London Company of Virginia. The London Company of Virginia. By the way, do you know where they get the name Virginia from? Yes. Who is the Virgin Queen? Was it who? Um, literally just passed away. And they now have a Scottish king on the throne of England and Scotland, thus Great Britain. Now, the London Company of Virginia. Now, I know the fun part is you get to read my writing. And that's half the fun. That's actually pretty good. Yes. Good Elizabeth died, yes. Go back in 1604. Oh, my girl. She <laughs> just died. I was like, Sorry. See, this is what we call context. <laughs> context are events going around. So if I'm talking about 1607, I'm probably not talking about 2002. <laughs> now I see what you're saying. In fact, she just, England just got a new prime minister. And so they literally just had a picture of her and the prime minister. And just came, but she's still getting on, yeah. How? She was not alive in 1604. Sure. Now we're good. Ever that happy? As far as Look at the claim. Now, they signed a contract or a charter. Contract, charter, same thing. Britain wanted to do colonization on the cheap. They couldn't afford it. Uh, Spain had almost, well, if you look at this yellow right here, this was all New Spain. And they had found all this gold and silver. They exaggerated. They found all this gold and silver. Britain, though, couldn't afford it. So they got a company to do it. So if it went under, the crown didn't lose much money. And they basically said this contract, you're, you're English, but we're giving the company all the land between this latitude line and this latitude line. Now they just had a claim. No, they did not bother to ask the people who live there. They just took it. Well, let me rephrase it. They have the claim and then they're going to conquer it. At least that's the idea. And there's also the French have a claim and the Spanish have a claim. When did this end? It went from here to where? The Pacific. Um, Massachusetts got all this. New Jersey got this and this. Yes, they had competing land claims. Pennsylvania got this. New York got this. They just gave all this land. And yes, that will be a conflict after the Revolutionary War when everybody's going to be claiming this. And yes, we'll be ignoring the people who actually live there. But they gave all this land. It's huge land. They landed there, and well, they didn't have any, they didn't have any idea. Three ships arrived from the London Company. Susan Cost and the Good Speed and um, the Discovery. No, you do not need to know the Susan Cost and the Discovery. Unless you want to. When they arrived out there, do you know what an estuary is? Ah, there's a good geographic term. You might have heard the term estuary. It's water. Think about where this wide river runs into the ocean. And an estuary is where um, the tides and the ocean affect the river. So you have this kind of a mix between fresh water and salty water. It's called brackish, which means a little salty. But the river actually goes up and down with the tide. So you see these along the ocean. Not a good place. Because you can't drink the water. You want to go further upstream. But they were desperate. And they believed that the whole continent 
the Americas, which is mountains of gold. The Spanish had found so much gold and silver that it doubled the money supply in Europe in 50 years. Now, Spain would blow it all and go, go into debt and become a corrupt uh, kingdom by the middle of the 17th century. But they had all this gold, and these people in England just assumed, literally, they would stick a shovel in dirt and come out gold. That's what they believed, just gold everywhere. They bought it. And so when they sail up this estuary, think about low tide, a long time, swampy land, which also saved them. So they weren't very American Indian four tribes that lived in that area. But they're further in the interior because they don't want to live in the swamp. Think about low tide, exposing sandy beaches in the sun. And what do sandy beaches in the sun look like? They're rich. They got off the boat in 1607 and they dumped all their supplies out of their barrels and filled those barrels with sand. Oh, we're rich! They were shoveling sand in these barrels. They tapped it up, put their name, and sent the sand back to England. Their fortunes are made. And what happened to them that winter? Half died. I should add, I always wonder what happened when they got to Portsmouth, you know, right here. <laughs> oh, we got the stuff. They sent us barrels of sand. The next year, more came. And what did they do? Same as happened. I'm not kidding. They sent more sand. And they thought, you're lying to us. You're taking away our riches. And they did the same thing. That's why by 1610, they literally called it the starving time. Only 30% survived. When ships arrived in 1611, they literally found crazed, mostly men, because it's mostly men who went, crazed men on the beaches, gnawing on human bones to survive. So they had to resort to cannibalism to make it. And let me give you an important fact. This is a, maybe, this is a life lesson for all of you. Cannibalism bad. Bad. Don't do it. Okay, if you miss lunch, I know. But no, no. Cannibalism bad. See, this is film. That will be on the test. Addictive drugs like tobacco bad. Cannibalism bad. Life lessons. Okay, so disaster. 1613, John Rolfe, what was the crop that Rolfe started cultivating, mass production? Tobacco. I should add, what Pohatu did he marry in a political marriage? Yes, Pocahontas. Pocahontas, who would be kind of sent on a publicity tour back to England. She passed away then. And tobacco. Tobacco? It's tobacco today. Tobacco. Out of my head, tobacco. Tobacco. Okay, so is that a problem? What happens to soil after three years? Oh, so we got plantation agriculture, cash crops, they can start making money. How did most people back in England consume tobacco? There's two ways. Smoke, right? Do I know the other way? They would grind, they would dry it and grind it up into a fine powder called snuff, and they would snort it like that. So give them a hit of nicotine. Yes, it would eat away the septum and the nose, and they'd have these kind of flat faces. It did be girls bad. But if you ever hear them say snuff, or you see like a period movies from the 18th century and they're snorting something, it's tobacco. Which really it, it does, it eats it away. And I guess you know there'll be an agony. Currently breathe, but they'll still be snorting that stuff. All right, so what do they need? What happens after three years to land? Three, four years? Do they need land? They always need land. You'll find out anybody involved in plantation agriculture, they are obsessed with land. What president of the United States would purchase the land claim to where you're sitting right now? You know? Jefferson. And what was Jefferson's occupation? Yeah. Tobacco. He had slaves and they picked tobacco from him. Yes. He's obsessed with life. They're just obsessed. They constantly need life. They know if we're going to make more money, we need life. And since they know they're going to make land, they also want to buy land early so they can sell part of it and make a profit and then buy more land. They're obsessed. And labor, because this is backbreaking, miserable work. Stuff we talked about before, but 
See where we're at now? So when they start using up the land, so the first tobacco plantations, it's not great land, but they have to clear a swamp. It's pretty tough. Right along here. But pretty soon they're going to have to move. What's the only place you're going to get land? And they're going to run into what? The surviving tribes, devastated by disease, but desperate to hold on to the land. And their communities have been destroyed. They had villages, they had farms, they, they, these were farmers. And now it's done. 90% of the population dies and can no longer do it. It's devastation we can't even wrap our mind around. When, get my name from DeSoto, who was a conquistador, he went through this area here in the 1540s, through here. And they talked about just seeing villages of 30, 40,000 people, massive farms. They couldn't believe how many people were there. By the way, they uh, bought their food with them, walked alongside of them, pigs. Lots of diseases come from pigs. When the French came down here 100 years later, what did they find? No, built. Overgrown, villages were gone, animals everywhere, they all died. So it just was, it's incomprehensible what happened to the Americans. But to the Virginians, that's our land. The few tribes tried to fight back, and this is going to be the template all the way until 1889 in what's now the United States. War. The tribes will fight like heck against settlers who come in and try to steal that land. And they'll fight. We have a land claim or we live here. So, for example, 1619, 1621, there's going to be war with what was an enemy, or Pocahontas was, the Pohatans. And they formed a confederacy amongst their old enemies to fight the English. And this is something that American Indian tribes would form a confederacy with enemies, and have a brief shot at stopping settlement. But then they would either lose, devolve into fighting. We'll see this in the 1630s and 1670s in Massachusetts, all through the early 1700s. Uh, this thing called Pontiac's War right here. Um, the Northern Confederacy Wars, the Compton Wars, so it just became too late for them to hold it. But they attacked virtually every village on the James Peninsula and along there that the Virginians had. And they won. They pushed the settlement back. And the Virginians decided, I mean, literally, they're going to have a surrender. A surrender ceremony, kind of a big feast. And they were basically agree, basically agree, we're just going to hang out at the very end of this peninsula, the Powhatan's Confederacy War. And one thing to know about these two tribes, I mentioned this before, men did the fighting and the hunting, and who made all the decisions? Women made all the decisions for tribes. Women did the hardest and most important work for a tribe. They ran the home, they did the cooking, the food preparation. They made the decisions. But in this kind of, just the way that they divided labor, men would meet, but do what women told them to do. Very surreal thing looking back at it. It's very weird for the British. They couldn't figure this out. A lot of British women would go to the Virginia colony and run away to the tribes because they had many more things. They called it going native. Just leave. Some men would do, but a lot of women left. But anyways, back to this. They won. Big stuff, big feast, followed by toasting and wine to celebrate the Powhatan victory. What happened? The wine was poisoned. And they killed the best warriors that Confederates survived. So who won? Virginia won. That's how they won. And this is going to become a template. Massachusetts would do it in the 1630s, 1670s. It's going to happen time after time. No, we don't have time to go through each one. I want to make sure we set the stage. And yes, the United States would do things like this. Many times, especially in the Great Lakes, the old Northwest, it was called right here, all the time. Well, so there's continuous fighting, but that's an example of the fight. So 
even though the Confederacy was beaten, the further they move west, those along the edge of the frontier, they're going to be attacked by the various tribes trying desperately to defend their land. So let's get to labor really quick. Well, that's going on. Labor. Review. What were the people that would sign a contract? Seven years? Indentured servants. People who did not have a contract. Slaves. And these would be slaves from the Americas, there'd be slaves from Europe, there'd be slaves from Africa. They tap right in to this slave trade here. So there were people that were captured in Central Europe, enslaved by groups like the brand new Ottoman Empire that was right here, and then sold to the Portuguese who sold them to the British. And they're of European descent, or North African, some Asian. There was a slave trade that ran this way. The Portuguese tapped into it when they sailed around here. So they started sending African slaves. But it was just this hodgepodge of people. Could you tell the difference between an indentured servant and a slave? Not really, except one had a contract. I can't emphasize that enough. A contract. Seven years, they're a slave, and then they're free. Slaves did not have a contract, but almost all of them would be like a indentured servants. So they would be get their freedom sometime. And usually it'd be an individual deal they would make. If you agree to work for a set amount of time, you'll get your freedom. And yes, they were treated horrible down the road. <coughs> their children would not necessarily be slaves. It was really confusing hodgepodge. And then of course, a lot of free people that were very poor and having to work almost like indentured servants. That's the labor. So they're all eventually you know, free, and rights are up in the air because indentured servants got a contract because they are, and please get this down, they saw themselves as, even though the country's going to be called Britain, they are English citizens. They're English. Okay, the term citizen as we know it did not exist. They're only citizens. They're not. But other than that, they're treated horribly. And then everybody, if they're free, so they'll tell slaves, don't run away. You'll be free sometime down the road. By the way, someone third period brought this up. What happened if an indentured servant loses their contract? They got to sign another one going another seven years. You think the game's rigged against poor people? There we are. So back to this. They get a head right. Now, this is a medieval term, a head right. There's a lot of debtors, so this also happened in Britain. Head right. That means you're right as a person. And what makes you a person? Your head. That's literally what it means. Me, I have a head. Head right. And what is it? Okay, freedom. That's still, you know, vague. Freedom. But the big thing is land. Generally, a generic 50 acres. Maybe a horse, maybe a mule, maybe some seed. But the big thing is land. What land would they get? Hmm? So they get the used up land. I got land. Can they make any money? They quickly go into debt and therefore almost almost immediately, what do they have to become after one or two years where they can't grow anything? Basically, do this again. So they're cheated that way. Well, what other land would they get? So remember, there are people desperately trying to defend their land against settlers who are taking their land. All on the frontier, they're fighting back. So let's say in 1660, the frontier is right here. Where would they give them land? Here a little bit further west. They would give the head right way out the frontier. So who's attacked when tribes are trying to defend their land? Those former dentured servants and farmers. Does everyone catch that? 
they're going to get the worst land or land on the frontier. You know where this is going. Now, is there a government in Virginia? The London Company of Virginia is this joint stock company until, until the crown takes it over at the end of the century. It's here. Virginia here. How long does it take to get from here to here? In context, obviously, it's obviously, so 1650. Six to ten weeks. So any decision they make here is already old and can they enforce it? Eh. So they formed their own government. Another name for landholders in Virginia, it's, it's an old English term, it's called Burgesses. So they're going to create what's called the House of Burgesses. That's a G, that's an R. House of Burgesses. To this day, remember, members of the State Assembly in Virginia are called Burgesses. In Montana, they call them representatives and senators. They're, they're Burgesses. Burgesses are the landholders. So they're the plantation owners and the big ones, not the small landholders, the big landholders. They make laws for the colony and they also tax themselves to pay for things like what do you call people who are, they train once a month as a soldier, but they're farmers or whatever they might be, shopkeepers, whatever. What do we call it? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they pay for the militia. What's the militia? There's militia in every state. What's the militia for the state of Montana? What do they call it? Yeah. That's the National Guard, militia. It was actually part of the Constitution and an amendment about militias. But they do the militia for defense along the frontier or Spanish attack or French attack. They do taxes, they do laws, they kind of run it. These are the big landholders. Now they represent whom? They govern the whole state, or colony, I'm sorry, but they represent themselves. They make laws for themselves to benefit themselves. They want to pass laws so they keep their land, keep their plantation, get more land, and keep the labor under control so they work and they get the money. That's the House of Burgesses. So this first representative body, House of Burgesses, they're making the laws. And what do we have? Former indentured servants, former slaves with nothing. Either they're losing their land or they're under attack. They go complain to the House of Burgesses, and the House of Burgesses is like, eh, goodbye. We're doing just fine. This is working great. They have no legal representation at all. They're in debt. They have to become indentured servants again. No, oh, well, we're fine. It's working great for us. And that's what's going to lead to the biggie. 1676, Bacon's Rebellion. Now, there were other ones in the past, past or past, past. Bacon's Rebellion, other rebellion. Nathaniel Bacon was a landholder at a plantation out near the frontier. They were under attack. It's right about here, the original. Right about here. They're under attack by people trying to hold their land. So they had come in, taken someone else's land, and now they want protection so they can, I guess, protect their what they stole. He demanded protection way back here at Jamestown and Williamsburg. Williamsburg, which has become a colonial attack, uh, capital, because Jamestown was built in a swamp. Swamp sent a sink. Has anyone ever been here? If you ever get a chance go, it's really cool. Williamsburg is part of the park service, and now it's like you go back in the 1700s. The whole town, they have a bunch of green actors, and they act like it's 1700, and they stay in character. They act like it's there, and you go like into this colonial town. It's really cool. But then Jamestown, they have a, um, they have a rebuilt the old settlement. Right across the peninsula is Yorktown, the most important battle of the Revolutionary War, and there's a Civil War battle there too, called the Battle of Yorktown. So it's one of the most historical, most historically important points. It's really cool. They did a great job. And you know, somebody might, you know, might not 
appreciate or understand it, but if you get a chance, go. People drums and I really recommend it. But anyway, they're back here. And they're complaining. Finally, Bacon said, we're not going, we're not going um, to stand for not having representation. No more will farmers be driven out of business, going to den, become a denture disturbance again. We are going to fight back against this. And they rebelled. And who joined Nathan? Oh, no, I'm sorry, Nathaniel Bacon. No, it had nothing to do with Bacon. Who joined them? Indentured servants joined them. Slaves joined them. People who had the head rights were getting kind of cheated. They all joined them. So we have this, all these people. We have people of European descent, people of African descent, people of American descent, all joining. So people with all kinds of different shades of skin color, all joining together. Or you could say people of all kinds of different races, yet the term race had not been invented yet. Gee, I wonder uh, what that's going to come, where that's going to come from. They all join together. And they say, no longer are we going to have our farms taken because we can't pay debt. You're going to protect us along the frontier. I know it's problematic about the people who live there, ignoring the people who live there and fighting and wanting to show them. But they fought back. Jamestown, or the local officials there, did what they always did. They sent the militia. But along the frontier, what kind of people make up the militia? Same people. And what did they do? They joined the rebellion and started marching on Jamestown. Mass panic. There are a heck of a lot more indentured servants, slaves, and free people who have nothing than there are Burgesses. They're outnumbered. A heck of a lot more. Like 90 to 1. Or 9, I'm sorry, 100 to 1. The only thing that saved Jamestown was by the time they got there, it was fall, and a lot of these people were farmers and they had to go back and pick their crop because they're in debt and they got to pay back their debt. That's the only thing that saved them. They were able to buy off some people to put down the remnants of the rebellion, and Jamestown was saved. The colony was saved. The Burgesses survived. But this is shockwaves all through the colonies, all the way to England. And why this is so important is every other colony would do the exact same thing. They would all follow this, and therefore British ideals would spread all around the world. Other nations would follow this, or are kind of doing it, but not as directly as happened at Bacon's Rebellion. And this is going to change the world. Bacon's Rebellion. There were events that might have done it anyways, but Bacon Rebellion is that key moment that everything changed. Because you can imagine what the Burgesses, the Burgesses are thinking. This could happen again in four years. We don't want to change what we're doing. We're making money and we want to stay in power. But we got to make sure that these groups don't unify again. They pass laws. So they pass a series of laws to make sure that they won't unify again, to divide them. And what do we call these laws? Now, these go back to the history of slavery, but we lump them together as the slave codes. Well, certain laws will apply to slaves. And remember, slaves from all over. And certain laws that will apply to non slaves. Now, the slave codes have a lot of laws. But the most important of these laws comes back to that contract, where the laws would say anybody who had that contract will have the rights of citizens of the colony of Virginia. And if you did not have that contract, you did not have those rights, a.k.a. slaves. There's a disease that came from Africa. It spread up into England, but also spread to the New World. Carried by mosquitoes. It doesn't, it's not necessarily dead, deadly, but it makes you incredibly sick. You become a lethargic, can't work, and yes, can't be dead. And the best part is, the best part for everybody, you can recover and then it comes back with a vengeance, maybe more than five or ten years later. We know that disease. Malaria. Malaria was all over this area. Now you're, now you're probably wondering, why malaria? Why are you talking about malaria now? 
Yes. Malaria everywhere. Malaria. Now, there are two strains of malaria. Two strains. One strain of malaria. People south of the Sahara Desert have immunities to. They're relatively immune to them. Oh, they might get sick, but they're relatively immune. People north of the Sahara Desert, they're susceptible to both strains of malaria. So people from, let me throw a country out, England, are susceptible to both strains of malaria. Remember they live in a swamp? I should add, have you ever heard of sickle cell anemia? That appears to be tied to that immunity. No one's exactly sure why, but people of sub-Saharan Africa also can suffer from sickle cell anemia. It appears to be tied together. But anyway, let's get back to this. Indentured servants, what's happening to them when they throw them into the swamp of Jamestown? They're dying of malaria. I'm laughing, ha, <laughs> they're dying of malaria. In fact, they had a term for it. The first six months when someone from Europe would go to the New World, it was like, are they going to survive that six months? Only about half survived. They actually had a name for it, and it's such a creepy name that I have to tell you, at least it gives me shivers. They called it seasoning. If you survive the seasoning, then you have a chance to survive. Malaria would hit, they couldn't work, uh, they would get so ill that they'd be susceptible to other diseases and sometimes die, and it might come back. But there's two strains of malaria that's just ravishing them. No, they did not know the mosquitoes were spreading. Were spreading. What, what's happening to African slaves? Oh, so that means the same thing was happening to slaves that were picked up here. North African, Asia, both malarias were ravaging them. What's happening to the slaves here? How would their seasoning be? Potentially not as good. So what is happening by the 1670s? There's a financial incentive for plantation owners to try to do crops. To bring in what type of people? Slaves from the or South African slaves. African slaves will call them, but there are there are North African slaves, but they were susceptible to both forms of malaria. South Africa. So sub-Saharan African slaves. Because they had a better chance of surviving the malaria the season. So there's more African slaves. All right, document time. You're not told the contract was a big deal. Here's a document. This is called, now, there's actually three laws here, but we're only going to read Negro Women's Shoulder. This is a series of laws that were passed by the House of Burgesses called the Fornication Laws. By the way, you don't look, at, when you get a document, don't do, I have a bad habit with this, and I bet all of you do too. If you're told to read something, what's the first thing you do? Don't tell me what you're supposed to do. What's the first thing a lot of you start reading? You just start reading. Read, read. Get out of that app. First thing you should do, read the title. Read the date. Give yourself a back, some background. These are the fornication laws. So they were passed around the time of this one after Bacon's Rebellion. So this was a result of Bacon's Rebellion. When you read a document, read the title, and then get historical context. I repeat, think of a couple things that were going on. And what's the most important thing we know? We know indentured servants, we know African slaves, and we know Bacon's rebellion. If you just start reading this without thinking historical context, it becomes words. And we've all done that. Words, 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 words. And you won't be able to really understand what it means, especially when you read, okay, a primary source document from 1691 which is going to be confusing. And if you ever read laws even written today, they're confusing on purpose, but they're confusing. 
It's a unique context, background. And then you read. Now remember, we just had Bacon's Rebellion. They pass, they're going to pass these laws called slave codes. These are Burgesses, the very wealthy run things, and they want to make sure this doesn't happen again. And there's an increasing number of slaves in sub-Saharan Africa because of malaria. So what I want everyone to do now, we got that, we're going to look at Negro women's children. Now, go ahead then and read this, just this first paragraph. Read. Oh, quick. Do we know what fornication is? So fornication, it's important to understand this thing. It is. This was meant to be, I mean, this was a sin, but it, to their point of view, they're trying to say this is bad. But it's sex outside of marriage. And this is not a health class. But I'm thinking, if in, so my assumption is you probably know your children. We can all back to this. Read it and think in that term that we just talked about. I know the language. And if you're done, I know we're doing it right here in class and it might be pretty basic, but if you jot down one or two words next to it, just trust me. You have to read, let's say, six documents and then write an essay about it. You might forget what you read two documents ago. I know I would. Unless you're one of those people in the photograph. Anyone? Really? Helps, huh? Well, no, it's not. Just because you know stuff doesn't make doesn't mean you're correct. So you have to, but it, but it helps, doesn't it? It does help. Did you catch what this is about? Do you see why this is such a big deal? This is one of those things that literally changes everything. Children of slaves are what? According to this now. Hmm? Can we get that? Yes. They're the same condition of the mother. So, mother is a slave, they're a slave. Mother's a slave, children's a slave. What did they just create? When did this, before? These laws, like this one, so this is the best example. Slavery was how long? Kind of up in the air, wasn't it? How long is it now? It's permanent. It's created permanent slavery based upon the mother. It doesn't matter who the father is, only the mother. Does everyone catch that? Only the mother. If the mother's a slave, the children's a slave. The children are slaves. The child is a slave. Is <laughs> but permanent slavery. Are they free someday? Are their kids free? Indentured servants? Someday? Yes. Then never. Why? They don't have the contract. An increasingly large number of the slaves are from what continent? And more and more, slaves of African descent are going to be synonymous with slaves. The mother is a slave, the child is a slave. Oh, that means what's happening to the slaves? Who are the fathers being times? The owners. <coughs> Who are the owners? What kind of people? They're probably married too, the children. 
Do they want to admit they're doing this? So that's why they call it the filthy sin of fornication on here. <laughs> if you look down the first sentence here. So what's happening? What are the owners doing here to their female slaves? Because female slaves have no choice in this. This is not like some romantic love. They do not have any choice at all. They are owned. What are the owners doing? They're raping their slaves. They're raping their slaves all the time. And here's the amazing thing, is there now an incentive to rape their slaves? Because it creates more what? So will this stop? Who just passed the law? This makes permanent slavery. This is one of the most important laws in the history of the United States and the world. And it came out of Bacon's Rebellion. And who does it apply to? More and more, you can imagine what's going to happen. You have people who are indentured servants, and but someday they're free. The slaves aren't free. Doesn't matter what, if they're from African descent or European descent. I should add, that means virtually everybody who is in the United States and they're a descendant of a slave, they're probably European, African, and probably American. They're probably all. But all that matters is mother slave, their slave. That's all that matters. And more and more slaves are going to be black. Do they have rights? Whites have rights. Do they have that contract? Why? Well, because they pass these laws. How long is it going to take people to say, no, wait a second. I must have rights because maybe, or I might, or I don't have rights because whites might be what? What did they just create? Hmm? Somebody, I think, said it. Yeah. Say it again? Yes. Well, that's coming. You know, that's happening, but. If you say one group might be better based upon color of skin, what have they just created? Where do you think racism comes from? Racism did not exist until colonial America. Oh, sure, there's difference about skin. By the way, I'm glad a lot of you are putting your stuff away. This is what we call kind of a big deal. So you might want to make sure you wrote that down, even though did you write down what I just said about racism? You better get that down now before you go, and then you can put yourself away. This is what we call a huge deal. Racism comes out of this. Racism is not natural. And on that happy note, I'll bet this in tomorrow. A couple more slave codes, a few more things, read a document, more assignments. I'm shutting off the film. Have a great day. Thank you. We'll see ya.